Fentanyl was the cause of 14 out of 15 opioid-related deaths in Windsor. The Ontario legislature is banning cafes for violating decorum. Doctors in Alberta call on province to act as NICUs are in crisis. Arrive Can contractor faces questioning in House of Commons. Pakistan acknowledges that it blocked access to Twitter during the election. And Spain leads the push to recognize Palestine. Good morning. It's Thursday, April 18th. I'm Nora. Here are your headlines. We start this morning in the Windsor-Essex region in Ontario, where 14 out of 15 recent opioid-related overdoses were linked to the use of fentanyl. That's according to the Windsor-Essex Community Opioid and Substance Strategy. The group put out an alert after it noted a high number of opioid-related overdoses over the span of a week. You will remember from earlier this week that a new study shows that there has been a doubling of opioid-related deaths in Canada between 2019 and 2021. The study calls for targeted harm reduction policies to address the crisis, though the article doesn't say anything about what might be done or is being done or should be done or isn't being done in the province of Ontario to fight the opioid crisis. Next, the Ontario legislature has formally banned the kefea from being worn in the province's government house. Muriel Dresma from CBC is reporting that the logic behind this move is because it makes a political statement. Unlike, say, the neutrality of a suit and tie or those power pumps that so many people torture themselves to wear on the job at Queen's Park. In an email, this is how MPP and Speaker Ted Arnott explained his reasoning. Quote, the speaker cannot be aware of the meaning of every symbol or pattern, but when items are drawn to my attention, there is a responsibility to respond. After extensive research, I concluded that the wearing of cafes at the present time in our assembly is intended to be a political statement. So, as Speaker, I cannot authorize the wearing of cafes based on our longstanding conventions. Unquote. Extensive research, eh, uh, Ted? The Ontario NDP is objecting to the ban, as is no longer NDP MPP, independent now, Sarah Jama. Merritt Stiles says the legislature allows people to express their cultural symbols and banning cafes would be contrary to that. She notes that kilts, kirpans, vivivankas and chubas have all been worn in the legislature and all have been items that have been used to signify resistance. Sarah Jama said that banning the kafea is not too surprising, considering that the fight to erase Palestinians is at the heart of the ongoing genocide. She said this, quote, seeing those in power in this country at all levels of government from federal all the way down to school boards, aid Israel's colonial regime with these tactics in the oppression of Palestinian people proves that reconciliation is nothing but a word when spoken by state powers, unquote. It is generally ridiculous that a place of power of political debate and disagreement would police people's clothing like this for being too political. What's too political for politics? Next to Alberta, where some doctors are raising the alarm over the province's neonatal intensive care unit, saying that they're in crisis. In a letter to Health Minister Arianda Lagrange and Alberta Health Services President and CEO Athena Metalopoulos, doctors called for help from the province, citing a shortage in staff and beds. Data they provided showed that NICUs were between 95 and 102 percent capacity frequently. It's happened 30 percent of the time in the first three months of 2024. The letter also said that concerns were raised in 2022 and 2023 with Alberta Health to no avail. Now, I should say NICUs are like the Cadillac of care within health systems, and they are never at capacity. There's always, and I can tell you this, having lived at an NICU for about two months, there's always empty spaces and babies are moving around all the time from higher levels of uh, care and monitoring down to lower levels of care and monitoring until they're finally discharged. This is the canary in the coal mine of Alberta's health system. If the NICU is at capacity levels of 95% and more, that is stunning and something that Albertans should be extremely worried about. Now, earlier this week, the health minister floated the idea of airlifting babies out of the province as a possible solution. She later backtracked on those comments, but it shows you where her mind is, that this is not actually an issue that needs any kind of real or enduring change, that They can just be airlifted to what? Saskatoon? Okay. 
Doctors who signed the letter said the minister's response was disappointing and that action is needed now to make sure that beds are available. But here's the United Conservative Party showing us that pro-life actually never means that they're pro-life ever. They're just anti-woman. Now, an update on the Arrive Can story. In a rare move, the House of Commons has called a private citizen to be questioned. It's the first time in 100 years that this has happened. GC Strategies partner Christian Firth, who was the contractor behind the program, appeared before MPs for questions after they unanimously found him in contempt of Parliament for refusing to answer questions to the Parliamentary Committee. The Liberals opted out of questioning Firth because of concerns raised over his mental health. As a reminder, the Arrive Can project has cost Canadians around $60 million due to the government's reliance on outside contractors, according to the Auditor General. GC Strategies was awarded a contract worth $25 million. This came one day after the RCMP confirmed that it had executed a search warrant at an address registered to Firth. The RCMP said that warrant was unrelated to the Arrive Can investigation. Next to international news, the Pakistani government has admitted to blocking Twitter during the country's elections earlier this year. The Ministry of the Interior said in a court document that the reason for the ban on the platform was national security, though it refused to address the outage when it did happen in February. Activists had criticized the ban, saying it was an attempt to quash dissent during the elections. They were marred by accusations of vote rigging and calls for protest from former Prime Minister Imran Khan's party following alleged voting manipulation. His party uses social media avidly, as mainstream media in Pakistan censors information about the party and about Khan. The platform was blocked before and during the election and in the days after, as results were being calculated. A court ordered the government to restore access on Wednesday. And finally, yesterday, April 17th, marked Palestinian Prisoners' Day. This is a day that Palestinians mark the importance of prisoners to the Palestinian cause and to fight for freedom of prisoners and support for their rights. One in five Palestinians in the occupied territories has been charged and arrested. One in five, one in five. Now, when you include men, that rate is actually twice as high. Currently, there are more than 9,000 Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails. That number includes 200 children, and over 500 people are serving life sentences. More than 3,600 Palestinians held in prisons are people who've never been formally charged or tried. They're held in what's called administrative detention. It's a process where people are initially detained for six months and where that detention can be repeated indefinitely. Palestinian prisoners who face trial often face it in military court, usually without access to a lawyer or due process. Several human rights organizations have reported a marked increase in the arrest of Palestinians since October 7th, and many people released since October 7th have reported being humiliated and beaten while in detention. People are regularly denied medical attention, which has led to several prisoners' deaths since October 7th. One person who was jailed, Sufyan Abu Salah, told Reuters, quote, I went to jail with two legs and I returned with one leg. Those are your headlines for Thursday, April 18th. I'm Nora. You're listening to this podcast at sandynora.com on the Real News Network podcast feed and anywhere you get your podcasts. I hope you have a wonderful Thursday and I'll talk to you tomorrow.